So good morning, everybody. Uh, I apologize for my terrible French accent, but stay, don't leave the room now, right? <laughs> so we have a fundamental question. What is a collective burial? On the screen as are several definitions by different authors. For instance, a tomb containing several individuals used by a community for a certain period of time during which it is repeatedly reopened. Or human remains deposited successively over time rather than in a single episode. Even if this definition are varies, uh, this definition all includes three notions. First, the number, temporality, that is burial deposits are made successively over a certain period of time, and of course, a notion of space. That is, the burial feature can be reopened. This definition covers, for instance, Neolithic dolmens, as you can see on the right, on the left of the, of the slide, and Hippogean tombs of Western Europe, as you can see on the right uh, side of the slide. It could also cover Tolos tombs and house tombs of early Bronze Age Crete. So on the left you have Sisi, a very famous site. <laughs> so I insist a little bit. And it could also cover Merovingian sarcophagi and modern charnel houses. These few examples give an idea of the diversity of the forms that collective burials can take. This diversity raises a, cru a crucial question, that is, were all these deceased gathered together for the same reason? And of course, the answer is no. The earliest documented collective tombs predate the adoption of Neolithic sedentary and farming lifestyles. Burial deposits containing the remains of multiple individuals are, for instance, known from Mesolithic Western Europe and from the Natufian Near East. But it is during the Neolithic and Bronze Age that collective tombs became widespread in Europe and the Near East. Why did they become so frequent at that time? The answer to this question often tends to be connected to changing patterns of territoriality within the context of adoption or intensification of agricultural practice. But the existence of pre-Neolithic examples should warn us against establishing a strict correlation between the practice of collective burial and a specific lifestyles. Besides, I really believe that Neolithic collective tombs did probably not derive from Mesolithic examples. We can also wonder why some Neolithic and Bronze Age societies chose not to adopt collective burial practices. For instance, individual graves remain the rule in Central and Eastern Europe during the Neolithic. Even at a smaller regional scale, we know of groups who did not bury their deceased collectively and this way distinguished themselves from their neighbors who adopted collective burials. So when collective burials are documented in a given region, there are a lot of questions and I hope we will find some answers to this question. There are three main questions that can be addressed. How were the corpses treated? The first issue is a very broad and complex one so much that it must be the subject of its own roundtable to avoid oversimplification. As a result, it will not be addressed here. Instead, the roundtable is focused on the interrelated questions of who are the deceased that were buried together in a tomb, and why were they buried together in the tomb. To this end, the scope of the roundtable extends beyond the Neolithic and the Bronze Age to include papers concerned with contemporary and recent historical societies. Ethnography can indeed inform the discussion by providing clues as to why the dead are sometimes buried together in living societies. In doing this, we do not aim at developing a middle-run theory of collective burials, of course. The aim is to broaden our perspectives regarding the ideological and social practices that motivate the gathering of the dead in the same tomb over several generations. However, bringing archaeology and ethnology together first requires an agreement 
on issues of terminology. To the social and cultural anthropologists that join us today, we must therefore start by asking, is our archaeological definition of collective burials relevant from your point of view? In fact, after, after a partial, of course, partial survey of the bibliography, we have been left with the impression that the expression collective burial itself is not very common in your discipline. Let's, for instance, take the case of Maurice Bloch's chapter on funeral and famadiana among the marina of Madagascar. We choose this example because it is a reference for French archaeology of days to discuss Neolithic burials. So, Maurice Bloch refers to the ancestral tomb or the family tomb of the marina, but the expression collective burial is not used at all. Generally speaking, ethnographic descriptions appear to make use of the concept of collective burial when they also take archaeological evidence into account. It is the case in Native American studies, where archaeological and ethnographic evidence is often considered together. This difference in terminology might be related to the fact that ethnographers have direct information regarding the relationship that exists between the deceased buried together in a tomb, in contrast to archaeologists who do not have access to this information and are thus forced to use the more generic term, collective tomb. Archaeologists and sociocultural anthropologists share, of course, we know that, common interests. But while archaeologists examine the material remains of past human activities, we know also that ethnographers are able to observe human activities as they are being enacted in their social and cultural contexts. The round of observation that can be made is thus radically different in the two disciplines. On the screen, the flowchart displays the total range of behaviors related to mortuary practice. Of all these behaviors, only corpse disposal is archaeologically documented in burial sites. Yet, in spite of conceptual differences between the two disciplines, the use of ethnographic analogies to interpret archaeological data is common practice. It can be traced back to the colonial period as Europeans got in contact with unfamiliar societies on other continents. They came to equate exotic people in distant places with European in the distant past. At first, ethnographic analogies were limited to helping the interpretation of old artifacts, but their use was later extended to patterns of past human behavior. During the 70s, the proponents of the new archaeology relied on ethnographic data in their attempt to develop a middle-range theory that would bridge the gap between human behaviors in the past and their material signature in the present. The premise was the following. If generalizing laws could be drawn, linking specific behaviors and their material implication in the present, it would then become possible to infer past behaviors based on the archaeological record. A major is issue faced faced by new archaeologists was the ethnographic descriptions offered limited information regarding the material consequences of human activities. This led to the development of what we know and what you call ethno-archaeology, which specifically addresses archaeological questions through the observation of living societies. The possibility of establishing cross-cultural laws such as those advocated by new archaeologists was questioned starting from the 1980s. But references to ethnographic data did not end, and ethno-archaeology continued to develop and to mature. General academic trends can be distinguished in ethno-archaeological research. It's kind of a caricature, but believe me, it's true. <laughs> In the Anglo-Saxon world, great emphasis is placed on the meaning of material culture and on concepts such as ethnicity, gender, 
agency and power. Francophone ethnoarchaeologists, on the other hand, tend to focus instead on the study of technology, processes of learning and transmission, and the social context of production. A similar broad distinction can be established in the archaeology of death. In the Anglo-Saxon world, as critics raised again the assumption of new archaeologists that a direct link existed between mortuary treatment and socio-economic organization, researchers came to emphasize on the role played by burial practices in social negotiation. As famously stated by Mark Pier Par Parker Pearson, the dead do not bury themselves. Funerary practices aim at restoring the order of daily life that has been disrupted by death. But since social, economic, and political relationships fluctuate, the order that is restored can be quite different from the order that prevailed before. In English-speaking scholarship, burial sites are in this way often examined as arenas where social identities, roles, and relationships are acti actively created by the living for their own benefits. In French-speaking scholarship, and especially in France, however, the very possibility of approaching funerary data with social question in mind is dotted by some. Therefore, mo many French-speaking researchers instead focus their attention on reconstructing the sequence of gestures involved in the funerary treatment of the dead. According to this school of thought, gestures could be reconstructed by thorough examination of the funerary record. But funerary rites themselves will, would be forever lost to the archaeologist, and very few studies try to discuss social organization. Our goal, then, in organizing this roundtable was to bring together researchers from different disciplines, different academic tradition, and with different backgrounds, so as to stimulate discussion <coughs> and debate. The panels include, therefore, archaeologists from different European countries, anthropologists, as well as two archaeologists with ethno-archaeological experience, bringing the gap between archaeology and ethnography. As archaeologists, our first concern is to identify collective burials in the archaeological record. However, identifying successive depositions spread over a period of time based on archaeological data is not trivial. Evidence of successive deposition is not always easily observable or preserved. For instance, take the simple example of the Neolithic burial from La Hoguette in the north of France. So in this illustration, you can see that the individuals are deposited next to each other and that their bones are not in contact. These are primary deposits with no evidence of secondary perturbation. Evidence of successive deposition is absent in this case. It is the context the fact that it dates from the fourth millennium before Christ and the geographical location that allows the identification of a collective burial, but it's not the archaeological data themselves. Another issue related to the interpretation of archaeological data concerns the distinction between two well distinct practices, namely, on the one hand, the successive deposition of multiple corpses in a single space a collective burial, which makes it necessary to reorganize or push aside the remains of earlier burials in order to make room for new ones. And on the other hand, the synchronic deposition of multiple corpses in different stages of decomposition. The latter case is abundantly illustrated by ethnographic literature on mortuary practices among Native American group such as the wounded. In this literature, the term ossuary designates burial events where the secondary remains of multiple individuals are reinterred in a generally mixed deposit. 
Some of the Jesuit missionaries who traveled to New World, especially during the 17th century, produced extensive description of the mortuary ceremony they attended. On this description by Brebeuf in uh, 1636, so it's very is the description of Frebeuf is particularly interesting since it describes the secondary deposition of human remains of the ossuary of Ossosabe, which was, in fact, excavated in 1949. So this provides us with an exceptional opportunity to correlate an ethnographic description of a sequence of gestures with the archaeological record resulting from this sequence of gestures. Documented by ethnography, every 12 years or so, Wendat's groups carried out a ceremony that was called the Feast of the Dead. The remains of those who had died since the last Feast of the Dead were exhumed and carried to a large pit in which they were thrown. This means that human remains in different stages of decomposition were rebellious together, ranging from completely dry bones to fully fleshed bodies. So we may wonder, is this deposit a collective burial? On the one hand, it could be, because the bone assemblage consists of the remains of people who did not die at the same time, and they were deposited in the same pit. But on the other hand, they were gathered in their final resting place in a single episode. This example addresses the limits of our archaeological definition of collective burials. So let's imagine that it is very easy to identify a collective burial. The second issue is, can we hope to identify relationships between individuals buried in collective terms in prehistoric times, relying only on archaeological and bioarchaeological data. The idea to organize this roundtable emerged out of questions raised by the late Neolithic mortuary record of southern France, on the one hand, and by the data of early and middle Bronze Age Crete, on the other hand. So we would like to have a closer look at these two examples. The first examples. The late Neolithic in southeastern France. In this region, dolmen and collective burials appeared at about the same time. Starting in the last third of the fourth millennium, before Christ, collective tombs gradually became more widespread and more diversified. This diversification concerns architecture, grave goods, as well as location. For instance, dolmens sometimes occupy prominent locations in the landscapes but they are also found on valley floors. The collective tombs were used over extended periods of time, which has significant implications on our understanding of the burial and social practices. First of all, archaeologists are usually not certain that the tombs actually remain in use without major interruptions during their lifespan. Grave goods are not always chronologically diagnostic, and when they are, they can often be associated with the disease they accompanied. Indeed, collective deposits from disturbed and mixed contexts that are the result of repeated use, secondary manipulation, reduction, and clearances. Cases of well-stratified context are extremely few. Collective tombs in the region more usually produced commingled assemblages in which different phases of use can be neither identified nor dated. This leaves archaeologists with very little to rely on to address the issue of potential criteria that might have defined which members of society had the right to be buried in the collective tomb. In fact, collective burials of southeastern France tend to be generalized into an homogeneous phenomenon that would have remained globally ancient 
thorough the late Neolithic, which means more than 1,000 years. But how likely is this? Can we really expect them all to relate to a single funerary ideology and to a single social order? Different social reconstructions have been suggested based on the distribution of collective tone. According to some researchers, the investment in the mortuary sphere would testify to the hierarchization of society over the course of the Neolithic. Collective tombs would, in this context, have been monopolized by families, clans, or lineage that also monopolized social power. Others argue that the density of tombs in some regions is such that it suggests instead that all community members were entitled to burial in the collective tomb. And finally, a third group of researchers stress the need to clearly distinguish large dolmens from cemeteries made up of multiple small dolmens. They indeed represent very different types of grouping in death, which could reflect different modes of social organization. So from this, two comments can be made. First, not all the members of burial community are necessarily deposited in the collective tomb. The circumstances of death, or the age at death, can, for instance, require a distinct funerary treatment. If we look once more at the Native American, ethnographic literature teaches us that young children and elders were believed to be too weak to make the journey to the village of the souls. As a result, they were kept apart so that they could remain in the wounded country and form their own separate community. A second comment regarding the social interpretation of collective tombs concerns more generally the social role of burial practices. As reminded earlier, Burial practices are not the static reflection of an established social order. On the contrary, they actively participate in the production and reproduction of society. As such, burial practices can play a role in the creation of social differences, but conversely, they can also help concerning existing social differences. This implies that we cannot assume that the individuals buried together in a tomb enjoy the same social status. Instead of reflecting equality, gathering in death can in this way be meant to give the illusion of equality. But even then, the special statue of certain individual can be displayed in the collective tomb as it has been suggested for late Neolithic warriors. This said, it is widely accepted that collective burials in sous-system France plus the emphasis on the group and not on specific individuals. Not only were the dead gathered in a single tomb, but as time went by, their remains were disturbed, their bones were mixed, and they eventually lost their individuality to become an anonymous part of the broader entity of the ancestors. Archaeologists studying prehistoric collective burials often call on this idea of ancestors as bending agents of the group. But archaeologists, some of them, are seldom able to define exactly who these ancestors were. The concept of ancestors is one of these concepts that we borrowed from endography, even though it is extremely difficult to connect to the archaeological record. This type of questioning can be transposed to Minoan collective burials. That's not a very good plan. As quit will be the subject of a presentation, we will only illustrate our talk with one specific example from the seat of Sisi. The cemetery of Sisi is located along the north shore of the island. It was used over about eight centuries. Most of the burial deposits were found in house tombs. Such rectangular stone built tombs were found elsewhere on the island, mostly to the north and to the east. 
more than 30 rectangular compartments, rooms, have been discovered so far in Sisi. They were built sometime at the same time, like you can see on the slide, compartments 11 and 12. There is an inner door that provides access from one to the other room. But some were built one after the other, or one next to the other. This raises a first question. What is the meaning of this spatial division? Or put otherwise, what is a tomb in Sisi? None of the collective tombs used during the pre-palatial period at Sisi contain the remains of more than 20 individuals for the moment. The presence of immatures suggests that they could be family groups. But in such a case, this would not necessarily mean that all family members were buried Sorry. We are buried in the family tomb. Know that all families at Sisi of Sisi were entitled access to the cemetery. Another possibility should be considered. These tombs were constructed taking into account actual needs and order of deaths rather than being reserved for family members. The evidence from Sisi points to a growing use of ceramic containers as well as wooden basket or textile containers at the transition from the pre-palatial to the proto-palatial period. This suggests a growing individualization of the disease. Nonetheless, the disease continued to be buried within the same collective built tombs. The major departure from previous practices seemed to be the fact that the bones themselves were no longer mixed together. The increased use of burial containers has been noted elsewhere on the island, of course, triggering questions as to whether this burial change reflects wider social transformation right before the construction, the construction of the first Minoan palaces. But the evidence from Sisi indicates that the change is not as radical as sometimes suggested. Let's, for instance, examine room 9.2. We observed four stratigraphical levels in the room. The first yielded a larnax with the remain of a single individual in primary position. But nearby, in the same stratigraphic layer, we discovered a collective deposit that could perhaps consist of all the remains cleared out of the larnax, or the same larnax. If proven, this would suggest that the individual's integrity mattered in the first step of the funerary ritual, but that it was not preserved in the last step. At the same time, some individuals from the same grave were never disturbed. These two examples of Neolithic and Bronze Age funerary context from two Mediterranean regions are intended to illustrate the question that we are dealing with in archaeology and the difficulty we are facing in the interpretation on funerary context to apprehend the social structure of the living. So we have a lot of things to discuss. Today and tomorrow, we will listen to a series of papers that will examine collective burial practices in different spatial and temporal contexts. These papers will address a variety of issues, such as social strategies, status, selection criteria, collective identities, memory, and control of resources. We will first listen to Estela Weiss, who will address the question of who is in the grave by means of a cross-cultural approach. So as we told you, there is a little change in the program. So Francois Lemaur will replace Nicolas Kov after the coffee break. And during the second session, we will therefore learn about the evidence from the pre-pottery Neolithic in the Near East and from Sir Tyloyuk. In the afternoon, we will move forward in time with three papers devoted to recent and current practices in Madagascar and Borneo. And then we will go back to Mesolithic Europe before closing today's presentation with a paper asking how different individuals and collective burials really are. This will open the way for a first general discussion 
that will end the first day of the roundtable. And tomorrow, there have been another change in the program, but we told you already. Uh, we will start with two ethnographic presentations, focusing respectively on Benin and Indonesia. And we'll then move back to prehistoric Mediterranean with cases study from Malta, Spain, and Greece. The last presentation will bring bioanthropology into the debate, hence opening the way for our final discussion. The final discussion will be a very, very important moment of this roundtable. You can express yourself on all the questions I ask in this introduction. So let's start right away, and I call Estela. Estela, the floor is yours. <laughs> 